our main speaker of this evening, who is Colin Patterson. Colin is a chartered physiotherapist and he has just taken over as the programme leader for the Bournemouth University Physiotherapy Programme. Previously, Colin has worked at the English Institute of Sports as a senior physiotherapist, English hockey, British gymnastics, British Paralympic Association, you name it, he's done it. And more recently, or so the rumours say, <laughs> more recently, um, Colin has been participating, participating? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at the Commonwealth Games as part of the medical team behind the scenes. And as an extra bonus tonight, we have Phil Smith, who's come along to give us the perspective of an athlete in all of this. So we've got both sides of the story. Phil's been involved in the beach volleyball circuit, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, been a professional athlete along those lines. So I'm sure you'll get to know more about both of them as the evening goes along. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Colin. Thanks. Evening. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so kind of, yeah, my remit in a sense when I was asked to do this talk was mainly around kind of Commonwealth Games being fairly kind of fairly current since ages ago, but obviously was in the summer in terms of my experiences working at the Commie Games. Um, but kind of in relation to that, I'm just going to kind of do a little bit about well, what is sports physio, how did I get into it, um, and then kind of use quite a lot of photos, to be honest, from Glasgow just to highlight what I got up to, what the role of the physio is, um, look at how physio is changing a little bit, or how it might have changed in terms of sports physio, bring in maybe a small amount of science rather than just being kind of photos of my couple of weeks in Glasgow in terms of how sports physio or what sports physios are doing with some of their treatments are a little bit different. So there might be a little bit of science, there might be a couple of videos if they work. Um, and that's kind of the, the plan really. And in a sense, yes, I'm a chartered physio. My main specialty is kind of sports medicine in a sense, um, but I've worked in lots of other environments while also working in sport. So I've kind of, yes, I've worked from time in sport, but I've worked within the NHS, other clinics, and done some sports on the side as well. So, um, and we'll talk about that as I kind of go through um, what we're going to talk about, really. So, um, like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about what sports physio is. My experience is mainly around Glasgow, and then this little bit about what's changed. But possibly, just to keep you slightly interested, um, for, well, quiz, is that the right thing? Within the slides and within the photos, you can just keep an eye out for a couple of these things. So if you're not interested in listening to me, you can see if you can keep your eye out for any of the new wonders of the world. There might be a pop singer if you squint closely. Okay. Um, there's an athlete that won the BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year three times. Um, and also you'll see Gwyn, the Welsh mascot, and you can just keep an eye out for how many times you see Gwyn. Okay. Which is a he. I always thought it was a she. But it's a he. That's, yeah. So I was at the Commie Games with Team Wales, but I'm not particularly Welsh, so hence why I've got win long for quite a while. Um, <laughs> so what does a sports physio do? That's a good question. Can I answer it? I'm not sure. But we often tend to think about it, or historically tend to think about it, as seeing it on the TV, that side of things, where we're spraying the awful cold spray, which yeah, I don't really use might be doing some stuff at a sporting event, maybe treating outside rather than in your typical kind of clinic environment, um, or you're kind of helping just people off the pitch. So they're often kind of thoughts around what a sports physio do, and I think tends to be the media and what we see on the TV in terms of working in sport. That's probably what most people see. But that's probably only kind of one remit of what a sports physio does, really. Um, quite a long-winded kind of definition by this organisation, the IFSPT, which is the International Federation of Sports Physical Therapists, which are an international body that are looking at kind of competency standards internationally for sports physio. They kind of come up with this much more long-winded, in terms of a sports physio, contributes to the enhancement of an athlete's performance by evaluating their physical and performance-related profile and advising or intervening to optimise conditions for maximal performance in a specific sport while working with others. So it's a fairly long-winded, but it doesn't really mention 
the on-field stuff. It definitely talks about maximising or enhancing performance and working with others and in terms of their performance and physical profile. And that's probably a bit of a move in terms of how sports physio is different because certainly it's not all about just that managing injury side of things, which we often tend to see. There's a really big role in terms of injury prevention work, which especially in elite sport is a hugely important factor. Because ideally in elite sport, you barely do any injury management because you don't want the athlete being injured in the first place. It tends to be a lot more about the other kind of two sectors, which is also about performance enhancement and they're potentially the really small tweaks you might make to how somebody moves, working with a strength and conditioning coach about optimising performance for that athlete in their position and what they need to do. So, if you like, there's three very simple, although they overlap, elements to what a sports physio does. Um, and, but it isn't just about injury management. But that might well change in different circumstances. If you're working in sport with your weekend warrior style athlete, you might really actually just be doing injury management, like I say, in elite sport. You spend a lot, lot more time on prevention and performance enhancement stuff. But certainly at the Commonwealth Games and certainly with Team Wales, who I was with, um, in that kind of environment, it is much more about managing the athlete there and then in order to compete um, to get to the end of their event. So it is much more about managing the injury, less about these other two things, really. So it's just to highlight that there's more to it than just the cold spray in reality. Um, how did I get involved? This is kind of just a bit of a summary, and I kind of don't like the slide kind of listing everything that I have done. But I have been lucky enough to do lots of different things in with different sports, really. But I think the key thing is, yes, I first started um, a few years after I qualified, being kind of mentored and working with others, and that's really the key thing. Lots of volunteering, time off, annual leave, weekends, not being paid. Most of this isn't paid in reality, um, anyway. So. A lot of early mentoring stuff to get some experience and then you can gradually get more and more experiences to be honest kind of within sports physio kind of doing an msc in a specific um specialty is much more commonplace now um, and is almost needed to get certain jobs so and that's certainly very new compared to 10 20 years ago that certainly wasn't the case at all so and i've kind of been lucky enough to work with quite a few big games the stuff in red because it's kind of pulled from, from another slide is I run quite a lot of disability sports stuff. Um, so not just able-bodied sport, but disability sport as well, and kind of mix the two. But certainly, um, they all kind of complement each other in terms of my experiences. Um, so in terms of Team Wales, that's who I was with. I actually did the last two Commonwealth Games in Melbourne and Delhi with Team England. Um, and I kind of, with this slide, why did I change? And I kind of going, I don't know, to be honest. Um, but it's actually quite interesting because Wales as a setup doesn't have a lot of money compared to GB England setups because um, their funding sources are very different without going into detail around that. So the way Team Wales do stuff um, is quite different. If you're part of a bigger team with more money, say Team England, they'll have lots of physios with their own allocated sports. And typically that physio will work with all the time. So they'll be full time with that sport or work with quite a lot. Team Wales don't. The only time the medical team for Team Wales get together is for the two weeks, maybe three weeks of the games. So it's done a little bit differently and it's a little bit more of a mucking in environment in terms of Wales. So you might work across lots of sports, do lots of different things and that kind of appealed really. Um, and also they kind of, Wales take a bit more of a mixture of a team, so quite a lot of well experienced medics and physios and some less experienced. So there's a bit more of a education, mentoring environment within Wales. Again, also appealed as to why I wanted to get involved. How do you get involved in something like that? Well, it's just like any other job. There's a job ad, you stick your CV in and apply, you go to interview and hopefully you get it. So all these kind of jobs are interview based, um, based on the typical job description in reality. Um, there's the interview, and the interview is quite key really. And it's kind of interesting again when reflecting on this talk, what was in the interview. Um, Yes, there's clinical skills, but those clinical skills to work in sport are quite different. So there's always lots of scenarios in these interviews. You might typically in an outpatient clinic spend half an hour assessing somebody's wrist, shoulder. The scenario was you've now got one minute before this person's about to go and compete. What would you do? How would you manage it? And that very much sums up often working in that context 
you need to be able to make really quick clinical decisions and do something about it there and then, which is quite a different skill set to working in a clinic typically where you've got more time and other people around you. So the clinical skills in a, in a, in a sense are different. Um, lots of scenario stuff and that might also be about what would you do in this scenario where a journalist is kind of pounced on you to ask you about an athlete or scenarios around drug testing and doping and positive testing. So they very much bring in all the other skills that we'll talk about as the slides go on that as a sports physio working with a team you need this kind of wide variety of knowledge that isn't maybe considered physio knowledge as it were. And lots of soft skills that they kind of bring out in a sense and I've experienced some really great clinicians who are awful working in this kind of environment and vice versa. Because you're working with a team you've not worked with ever before in a highly intense two, three week period. Because these games, as much as they're nice on the TV, they're all about results and money. And that's true for a sport at a high level. Your performances dictate how much money you get or don't get. It's possibly feel from kind of volleyball experiences and things get it is all about money in a sense so sports that do well get more money over the next four years sports that don't do so well lose money over the next four years so the results of these kind of events really dictate the next four year cycle so it is high pressure so you need to have the skills to be able to slot into that environment um, so I was working primarily with table tennis and it's got no table tennis and squash because they were at the same venue up in Glasgow, um, slightly in a sense. Um, so I was working with two squads I'd never worked with. I'd not met any of them until arriving in Glasgow. They arrived in Glasgow, met them for a few days before their competition started. Not knowing very much about the athletes, the staff, how they worked, how did they function, and kind of one of the key skills in this environment is just being able to slot into that team without causing any issues to them so that you work seamlessly um, and that can be a challenge so all those soft skills are really important and the ability to be able to adapt um, to things which you don't kind of realise are going to happen and I think within the medical team in Wales what happened while we were up there um, kind of one of the team members got really ill and needed an urgent liver transplant while in Portugal which that then meant the medical team had to do a bit of a shift around. A physio that was up in Dundee was shooting, flew out to Portugal. Um, I then went up to Dundee for a day amidst kind of lots of politics and things. So, to, so I had to slip in, if you like, to the shooting team dynamics, which were really interesting, um, do what I needed to do and then leave. But you just need the skills to be able to do that, as did the physio that was working with shooting that flew out to to, to Spain, Portugal for a couple of days and then flew back into to Glasgow. So the key thing is often not how good you necessarily are clinically, that is important, it's actually a lot of the other stuff that comes a little bit with mileage or patient or hourly mileage or just working in that environment. So you can't kind of underestimate experience over time um, of just knowing how to handle the situation um, and that's really important. Is it all glamour working in sport? Well, there are some nice opportunities it creates, and I've been to some nice places, seen some nice, Rio was nice, that was with a boccia, um, competitions of disability sport on the beach in Copacabana and the big marquee. Um, so you do get to go to some nice places, you get to meet some really interesting athletes, see really good high level sport. So yeah, it is might be perceived to be really glamorous, is it? Not really, because you generally, don't get a lot of sleep. That's Roger, one of the dogs, wearing his eye mask, which he did get a lot of stick for. Um, he actually moved out, and this is kind of another scenario. He moved out of his room he was sharing with one of the other dogs because the other dogs snored so badly. So Roger actually chose to sleep on a mattress on a floor in a room with four others because that was a better situation than the room he was in. So you kind of have to put up with these other life things that go on. Um, you're just thrown into this room within a team with not a lot of choice about what goes on so you don't get a lot of sleep um, you do lots of other jobs that isn't me hoovering so don't worry um, that's someone else but you're just doing lots of other jobs going out in really <coughs> shitty weather um, to go and collect some more ice and do things because you have to not because you'd rather not because the weather was pretty awful towards the end in Glasgow 
I wouldn't think it, would you? It was really nice, but then it got really horrid. Yeah, exactly. You're working in really, well, the car necessarily doesn't come out too clearly, busy environments, so you're working really hard. Um, you still have to do your usual admin and all those kind of things. Um, you can't really see there. Um, that's Dan doing his towel balancing act, but he'd gone to collect towels from a quite a way away and refresh them and all those kind of things that kind of go on behind the scenes, that kind of go with the nice bits of the work that you kind of have to do really. Um, working at games is also about lots of preparation because there's loads and loads of planning, so pretty much three years and 48 weeks going to preparing and about three or four weeks is actually the games. Um, so lots of preparation, <coughs> be it from my point of view goes in, in terms of lots of updates about anti-doping things because that's always key at major events because there's lots of drug testing that goes on. Um, lots of kind of pre-upskilling or refreshing in terms of advanced kind of trauma management stuff that all the medics and physios would do to be able to deal with those scenarios appropriately, um, potentially with a camera on you rather than just in terms of the media in theory. So the attention to detail, lots of preparation in terms of supplies, Harry Bow and gin that is, um, wasn't my gin but yeah, so lots of Harry Bow and gin and those kind of things kit and all that kind of things, quite a lot of preparation um, in terms of what goes into it, lots of logistic stuff in terms of what physio supplies need to go, how much of various things do we need to take for the different sports, and there's often satellite things, so that was Graham, who was the physio up in Dundee, was shooting, taking what he needed from Glasgow to Dundee, so there's a lot of preparation, um, and that's really, really key really, um, in order to perform well or create the right environment. So if you get it wrong for that two weeks, there's major implications. So lots of preparation goes into to working out of games, really. Um, typical games day, I mean, that probably doesn't sound too bad, to be honest. Um, typical day for me was probably getting up about six, not waking up. My roommate always seemed to get up a lot later than me in terms of his schedule. I might treat someone straight away um, to save me having to go to my venue with them initially. And then you're hanging around medical HQ, doing lots of prep work, getting the ice, towels, room sorted, schedule sorted, supplies, all those kind of things. Grab some brekkie, and always when you go for food, you never know when your next food's going to be, so you always stock up for the rest of the day, to be honest, because um, the food at my venue is fairly awful, to be honest. And I was typically there about 12 hours a day at least, so definitely to lots of supplies. Um, and again, the other kind of key thing when I was at my venue, I was working across two sports, there were about 20 athletes, a bit less than that, with my organisation in terms of knowing their schedules, where I needed to be when, organising with the different sports, when they were available for treatment, um, being courtside for the squash matches when they're on a certain court, um, more for just showing that there were people there sporting Wales but again lots of matches going on so in terms of me managing my time that's really key it's a case of not missing the bus to get to a venue at the right time and on the right bus not forgetting your accreditation so there's lots of managing your time things that are really different about working at a, a major games in reality you wouldn't have from just going with your team to a normal event there's a lot more security all the airport style scanners in and out, what you're doing at every venue and in and out of the village. So you kind of have to be fairly organised. It's very easy to leave the village, but not very easy to get in if you haven't got your pass. So you can very easily get out and forget it, but you don't realise you need to come back in if you haven't got your pass and things. So you, I needed to be aware, and everyone that works in that environment, you need to be very much aware of you being really, really organised in reality. Um, I often got back fair, fairly late to the village, about 10 in the evening typically. Um, we always had a medical meeting about 10, just to kind of debrief anything that might have gone on during the day in certain sports, update on any scenarios that might have gone on that you might need to be aware of, because media and journalists and things are everywhere at this kind of event, so you need to be careful that you have an idea about what's going on so you don't say something you shouldn't and things. You get in the habit of eating fairly late, um, then typically about half 10, 11, I'd probably then do my notes and everything from the day because um, the Wi-Fi wasn't very good at the venue so I couldn't do my electronic notes. So that would happen in the evening, then get organised, repack, possibly go to bed about 12 with my roommate already asleep. 
relaxed. These <laughs> things are always, yeah, and the art of not waking your room up is a key thing at this kind of event again. So, typical kind of day, how much physio do I actually do? It really varies. So often you're doing a lot of preparation, a lot of organising, being in the right place at the right time just in case. Um, and I think when I first got into doing sports physio, I felt really guilty on some days if I didn't do much physio and do much hands-on. But you soon kind of get over that in reality. And a great day is if I actually don't touch an athlete in the sense and do any treatment. It means they don't need it. I wasn't needed, but I was there. So it's again getting used to that environment. It's a lot of preparation, just in case kind of scenarios, really. And I think you also have to take on lots of different roles as a sports physio. I had to advise my athletes that maybe eating Greg's donuts wasn't the best thing to do immediately after his match and before his next one. He didn't really listen because the next day his mum brought him another big load. So, yeah, so you might often, in the sporting context, as a physio, take on lots of other roles because you're the only person around the team. So sometimes planning nutrition, dietetic stuff, recovery advice is often a key thing to be able to offer advice to. And often, I mean, this is just a picture of Kath, who was one of the sports psychologists working with Team Wales. Often one of your roles, because you're around the athletes, hanging around the sports venues, is just offering that peer support. So again, nothing to do with physio, but you just kind of get used to saying the right thing or not saying anything to athletes at certain times, so you don't put your foot in it. So a key bit of your role is about just supporting the athlete at probably one of the most important days of their career. Um, and not necessarily doing physio, but that real kind of support network. You generally need to be quite good at packing up logistics and organising stuff. Um, and then Dave, who's actually one of the sports massage people um, with Team Wales. Um, you have to make friends, and what's really important is to make friends with the right people, because um, you never know when you might need them. So, um, and that's a key thing. Often in this kind of scenario, you don't have a lot of control over things. And you might run out of stuff. Team Wales apparently used far too much ice and we kind of got banned from using certain ice from certain places. So you have to get quite good at taking it from places you're not meant to um, and things like that. So you have to be quite resourceful in terms of um, your skills, hence making friends with people in lots of different circumstances because you're never going to, you don't know when you're going to have to ask a favour of them. So that's other teams, other medical teams, you try and make lots of friends, you make lots of friends with the volunteers. Um, because often you rely on them to go and get stuff when you run out or we suddenly lost loads of ice bags, somebody clearly nicked ours. Um, so we then went out to all our venues and generally they have locked medical cupboards in all the venues but certain venues they were unlocked and so they suddenly lost all their bags at hockey. Um, because Nikki Mack, one of our physios, is very good at leaving things. Um, so you have to kind of have those skills where you can just make friends and kind of influence people when needed. And that's a really key thing again. So it really doesn't matter how good a physio you are, as long as you can do all these other things, potentially. Um, and I think the other thing, until you've done it, um, kind of feel, I might kind of allude to this, is you kind of, at these kind of games, get in a bit of a bubble, in terms of the games bubble, as often people call it. So for two and a half weeks, I didn't see the news, I really had no idea what was going on outside of the Commonwealth Games bubble, as it was called. Um, you don't have to think about what you're going to wear, because apart from the, the dock, got it wrong that day. You have kit colour days often, so you red, green, red, green, red, green. We went, so you don't have to think about what you wear. You don't have to cook. You just don't have to do anything. You just turn up with your tray and ask for what you like in the canteen. Um, you kind of get in this bubble where I had a, very much a schedule I was working to, so I didn't have to think about really what I was doing when, because it was just a bit of a Groundhog Day style of things. And you kind of get in this bubble of, it's all about the games, and that's all you're talking about. Um, all everyone, you can't really see it in that picture. Um, it's just watching the TV screen that was just here. Because um, there was games TV, so constantly the TV was just purely the sporting events. So you get in this bubble, really, of not really knowing what's going on. This is just this, what's called an infinity, um, which is one I had on my pass, which basically meant I could go anywhere within any of the sporting venues or villages without having to think about it with all the security and things. But it isn't until you leave the games bubble you kind of takes a few days to get used to. I don't know of at least two people that left their credit card in the pin machine in the service station on the way home from Glasgow because you're just not used to 
you know, it sounds really daft, but I know at least two people that lost their car on their journey home from Glasgow, because you're just not used to doing it, because um, you're very much in this bubble, which again brings with it its challenges of working in our team, so physios or docs that had children and things, it's hard for them, because you kind of leave your normal life behind in a sense, and within our physio medical team and admin team, there were two relative deaths that went on during the games, um, one of them stayed and kept working, the other one went home. Lots of things go on in your life, but you kind of get immersed in this bubble. So again, it's challenging how you deal with that. Um, some people don't deal with it very well and others do. So again, in terms of selection for events as staff, it's often about those, how would you manage yourself and other people that's key. Just kind of one disruptive member of staff, which we probably did have, not a physio or a doc causes lots of issues for everyone else in this environment, so um, the game's bubble is kind of really interesting really. And so while kind of doing this I was thinking, so physio, sports physio, is it any different now? And I remember on one occasion when I was actually in that medical room treating, looking around about um, what kind of things were the physios doing in terms of their treatment, um, and I kind of thought, actually, if you look around now compared to 10 years ago, it's probably a little bit different in terms of what's going on. There was lots of people using metal instruments scraping the skin away. Um, lots of people using cupping, so the old Chinese cups. Um, lots of hands-on things. Lots of people doing stretching in our area, but it was more yoga-based stretching than typical stretching. Lots of needling was going on. Good old K-tape, we don't know what it does, but lots of that was used, and lots of kind of foam rolling. So it was kind of interesting, I remember one occasion looking around thinking what was going on in terms of how that was different. So I think going back 10 years, and I think there'd be a lot more um, joint-based treatments going on within the sports physio kind of room. There possibly might be a few electrotherapy machines. I'm not sure if they really ever got turned on. We have three or four. So we used to kind of probably historically attach people to the machines, some ultrasound or to zap them with some form of electricity a bit more, but that really wasn't going on. So kind of looking around in terms of how things are different, and it possibly is more different in sports physio than other areas in terms of how we approach things, in terms of what are we actually doing when we do our hands-on treatment. And probably the key area with all of these, whether it's tool-assisted, Graston, instrument-assisted, skin scraping basically, Chinese cupping where you're vacuuming up and moving the cup around, kneeling, yoga stretches, all these things. Probably the thing that they all have in common and how kind of physio treatment's a little bit different is because of the more we know about fascia, um, which for those who are less medical is really the white stuff that you might see um, on anatomy diagrams covering the muscle that historically we used to cut away and not really worry about, think about. But the reality now probably answers most things about how treatments work. Um, so it's that white, gristly stuff that you might see with your raw chicken or your raw meat. It's kind of the white bits of the meat that are probably the really key thing about how a lot of physio treatments work. Um, so it's this white connective tissue stuff um, that lots of research in recent years has started to focus on and that's really how lots of those other treatments that when I look around the room were working because it was having an impact on this tissue really. So it is the white stuff that coats all the muscles within all the muscles that connects our head to our toes, our bowel to our ear, basically we're very much everything's connected by fascia and it's this tissue that's probably really key in terms of how lots of treatments work be it any form of poking and prodding, manual therapy, soft tissue therapy, anything like that. Fascia, I think, over the next few years is probably going to answer the questions about how it works or how people get pain relief or how things change because of our impact on fascia, which I don't know how well this is going to show, but if it doesn't, we'll just skip on. In terms of what I mean by fascia, it's a YouTube video, so there'll be a little ad for a few seconds, apologies. Skip over that here in a minute. No, don't worry, it doesn't need to. So, what we're talking about is really so, this is just a tendon within a fascial sheath. So, you just where how well you can see it, probably, and just how you're seeing some movement of the tendon within this spine coating. It's 
probably not coming out too well in his house there's this kind of cobweb style stuff and that's when you magnify that white gristly stuff on your chicken or meat or under the skin by about 20-30 times that's what it looks like so it's really vascular this fascia um, loads and loads of nerve endings in it so it gives our brain loads of sensory information um, and that's key with pain and these other things and actually how fascia moves plays a really important function in allowing normal movement so that's really really key and I'll show you that as an example of someone in back pain in a minute but all those tissues and I'll show you in terms of acupuncture impacts this fascial tissue poking and prodding massage impacts this tissue as does the cupping yoga and all these things and I think that's kind of a big change potentially in sports physio maybe more than other areas of physio in terms of how much we think about this white stuff it's got a really good blood supply loads of nerves in it and so on let's shut that up and show you just kind of one other example um, so if, hopefully you'll see this so this is somebody without back pain and these are just a couple of video Ooh, apologies let's go back some of you might have seen something similar and what we're looking for is how you can see this is someone going on a bed into flexion and extension how you can see there's this sliding going on almost the top layers are not moving quite so much but you're getting this movement between the layers here and above can you see that it's probably not the clearest but if we then look at someone who has back pain to trust to the strap to the same bed there's not very much movement going on so you see a hint of a bit of a jiggle but if we then compare that to someone who's saying back pain with no back pain how suddenly again there's a lot more movement between these tissue layers and that's normal and that's probably abnormal and the more we know about the fascia again in terms of it being a pain source that's key so this normal movement is really key because in sport we're often about optimizing movement they're getting into some weird positions where they need really good flexibility hence kind of this fascia is becoming a problem and not behaving as it should do um, it can cause problems more so in sport potentially than others and that's why I use loads of yoga stretching because again the old anatomy books of biceps goes from here to there reality it, it's interconnected with everything from our hand all the way up into our neck the fascia on our head connects all the muscles down our back hamstrings calves under our feet everything's connected so when we're stretching we need to look at the whole fascial chain so that's why yoga poses and stretches do do that it's much more functional so our kind of train of thought possibly more in sports physios using some of this fascial knowledge to adapt what we're doing acupuncture we know when we stick a needle in someone and you twiddle it round it whirls up and again it's not the clearest but you might get the idea of how you get this cotton wool type stuff surrounding the needle because the acupuncture needle impacts the fascia <coughs> the skin scraping so with a metal spoon you can do it or with an expensive aluminium tool rubs on the skin creates friction and heat that we know impacts a, a substance called hyaluronic acid between these layers which if it isn't functioning means they don't slide properly like we saw on the low back pain stuff so the tools whether it's the Chinese cupping and moving it around scraping with the skins or the needles or the yoga is all impacting this white fascial tissue really so and I think that's a key thing in terms of how physios evolved and in terms of what's going on in physio when we actually do our hands-on treatment is I think we're much more fascia aware than we used to <laughs> so if you have any questions about that later happily will so that was kind of one area of well, how sports physio a bit different now um, I think the other area in terms of sports physio and I suppose sport in general is kind of the finance and the money aspects especially the high level and elite sport um, has a lot of impact on what goes on as a healthcare professional with my registration and my professional standards I have ethical standards I have a duty of care to everyone I treat that I'm going to do the best for them um, the challenge often in the sporting environment is you have coaches and everyone that very much want to be involved with the athlete want to know lots about the athlete but I don't have to tell them anything in theory because patient confidentiality but often in sport that gets very muddied in terms of who knows what about people and that can be a real challenge to, to manage again from that side of things um, and the pressure of external things pressure from managers ex-player must play etc can be a real challenge and I think that's probably 
Um, that's probably why you might have seen a couple of years ago about Steph Brennan, um, who is the physio in Bloodgate, as it was called, um, who did get struck off for a while, who worked for Harlequins as their first team physio, was involved in providing um, fake blood capsules to players, so when they needed to make a substitution but couldn't, but they could come off and make a sub when injured, the player would go down, he'd give them a fake blood capsule, they'd bite it, and then the player would have to go off. But in this scenario, um, without going into loads of detail, that happened. The opposing team thought it had happened um, and kind of followed the players into the changing room where the team doctor for Harlequins in the locked room took out a scalpel and cut the inside of the player's mouth in order to prove that he was properly injured and he did have that. But basically the story came out, the physio got struck off um, because he wasn't acting within his professional code of conduct. Um, found out he, and it's, should I say it was common practice, it probably did happen quite a lot. Physio got struck off, the doctor who did the cut didn't, but that's just different professional bodies kind of disagreeing with the severity of what went on. Um, so that kind of highlights the pressure the physio was under from working in that kind of sporting environment from external people saying he must come off. He later got it overturned in the High Court and is now practicing again as a physio but was banned from working in rugby for a number of years. Um, and kind of the other example which some of you might have seen, just to kind of highlight just before we have a break in terms of the pressure of working in sport, again another YouTube video, so there'll be a little advert, which we'll ignore. So this was um, England v Uruguay, so you might have seen this while watching the World Cup. Where we're watching is down here, so slight apologies when it's on the large screen. So you might have seen, so this player was involved in a tackle, and then the play went on a bit later, so the TV was more interested in the foul in the box. But what went on just before was this player, who still hasn't got up, still hasn't moved, um, after being involved in a tackle a bit earlier on. And this isn't a good, not a good example of what hopefully would go on in terms of match. Clearly unconscious at this stage. So everyone rushes in, gives him a wiggle, which you wouldn't do. Um, but it obviously wasn't England, it was the Uruguay and different standards. So as you can see, he gets a good knee to the head. Um, clearly was unconscious. Eventually, we'll start with a bit more poking and prodding to wake up. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of saying, like, why didn't we get the penalty? Um, which was that bit, there he goes, and then he you knows gets there. And basically the player gradually gets up, we'll see in a minute, probably the clip. But this isn't an uncommon scenario, or wasn't, I should say, because there's now been a rule change. So we will now see the player who has woken up, after a bit more poking and prodding, um, with some help and support. Doc is saying, let's go off, let's go off player at that point has a paddy, says no I'm not, I'm fine, and the player plays on. Okay, so, so the manager and the player decided no he's fine, and he plays on. Which clearly was concussed and was unconscious, should have come off. But again, the pressure of the sporting event, media TV, big football game, at that time, who has the authority, who chooses whether the player goes on or off? You would hope the medical team, but in that scenario, overruled. The rules have changed now, and the doc with physio, um, it was just doc, it's now also physio, as of rarely recently, FIFA say, have the final say. So whether the player or manager want them to play on, the medical team for that country has the ability to say no. But that creates potential conflict from the team that you're part of, and so it's just kind of an interesting dynamic. And that's a fairly typical scenario that could go on quite a lot within working in sport that you're kind of also having to contend with managing your kind of duty of care which is your primary thing to your patient but you've got lots of other pressures going on around you really um, so that's kind of a brief ish about 40 minutes fairly spot on a summary of a few points just to do with how i got into physio what i get up to when i go to these big games um, maybe what's different about sports physio and how we treat things, the added pressures that you face while working in that environment, which again make it a bit less sport glamour. 
and that side of things for you to potentially have a think about. And then I think maybe after the break, Phil will we'll do his side of things, and then we'll be happy for any questions. So say any questions. Well, thank you very much. Very soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 try that one. <laughs> yeah. As if by magic, Helen's here. <laughs> 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 <laughs>